Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. While you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and just say one more prayer. Father God, I pray for the message this morning. As I already prayed, Lord, I pray that you penetrate hearts, Father. Those who need to hear your word, I pray it take root, Father, and, and from this day forward, grow in our hearts and our minds. Lord, that through this message, pray there are couples today, either here or those who watch online, whose marriages will be healed and restored. Father, that there will be homes that experience harmony, probably for possibly for the first time. And Father, I pray that you hear this prayer and that you grant this prayer. Lord, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. We're going to be reading out of chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and this is kind of a different sermon today, um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. But we're going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip down to verse 7, okay? It begins, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Okay, now we're going to skip down to verse 7. Likewise, the same word again. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you, of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, you know, we've been doing this series through 1 Peter, titled Aliens. The letter 1 Peter was written to the early church to provide them strength for their journey. As Christians, we live as aliens in a foreign land, seeking to go to our eternal home, to the place we belong. And... The greeting suggests this. This is where we get the whole idea. And the letter is for strengthening us in that journey. Today's message, like I said, it's a little different. It's a two-point sermon for those of you who pay attention to the points and things like that in the notes. It's not a three-point sermon that I normally do. That does not mean it's shorter. So just go ahead and cancel your lunch plans. I'm glad you're laughing. Some of you just groaned. That's okay. We have snacks outside. All right, anyway, it's, it's interesting because Peter takes this section and he interrupts, in a sense, what he's been saying all along. What he's been, he's been going through this trek and then he kind of stops and he focuses on something very important to the Christian life, the Christian home. It's a very important message this morning. It's very key to what he's saying. That's why Peter pauses and before I go any for, further, like I said, this, this message is about spouses, right? You can see that on the screen. And I want to be very blunt this morning. I do not have the perfect marriage. I'm not the perfect husband. My wife is not the perfect wife. And, okay, I don't want anybody to think pastors under delusions of grandeur this morning or anything like that. But I will say, I believe I married the perfect woman for me. And I'm not saying that to get brownie points. My wife puts up with quite a lot. You do not get to say amen there, but she does. And not just as putting up with me, she is a pastor's wife, and that is not an easy task. <clears throat> Jennifer, I believe, does carry the weight of that position with strength and with grace, and I could not ask for a better partner in ministry than the wife that I have. And as I've studied the life of Peter, I I think even though we don't know his wife's name, we're never told that, I believe he would have said something similar. He's not making a claim of how perfect and how great and how together he has it, but what he's setting is, he is setting the parameters for how we should live within our marriages. So Peter addresses this topic of marriage, right? And a good marriage is one that serves Christ, reflects Christ, and glorifies Christ above all things. And it's interesting because Peter's going to spend a, the bulk of this portion today uh, discussing about a woman who is married to an unbelieving man. A Christian woman who is married to an unbeliever. And if the reason he does this is very interesting because what we see, even in Scripture, 
is that most often when a family comes to Christ, if the wife becomes a believer, her husband may not necessarily do so. But if the husband becomes a believer, more often than not, almost 100% of the time, if you can believe the statistics, the whole family will be, uh, will be saved. We see this evidenced in Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas tell the Philippian jailer, they say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, both you and your household. And what happens when the wife accepts Christ but the husband doesn't? Right? That's, that's something that needs to be addressed. So Peter addresses it and he offers instruction and that's what we're looking at today. There is instruction for the husband too. Men, sorry, you don't get off the hook. But it's assumed his wife is a godly woman. But even if she is not, the husband's role does not appear to change very much for the same reason the role of a wife only changes a little. There's an effort to convert the spouse from the converted believer who is married to them. The fact is, what we do in our homes echoes throughout our community. It echoes throughout the, the world around us. If the nuclear family is in distraught, in chaos, and dysfunctional, then we can't be shocked when society becomes distraught, in chaos, and immoral. And before we go too much further into this sermon, I want to say something, and I want to make this very clear. I hope you're paying attention. Wives, I promise you this. Jesus Christ loves you more than your husband ever will. Husbands, Jesus loves you more than your wife is able to. Husbands, Jesus loves your wife more than you do. And wives, Jesus loves your husband more than you can. Parents, Jesus loves your children more than you are able to ever comprehend. So he's given us these parameters. The Bible is our boundary line. And he gives us these parameters to live within our home for the best possible home that we can hope to have with him at the center and as the center of our homes. The Bible is our boundary line, like I said, and within it we will find how to have a good marriage and how to have a good home. So if you're taking notes today, you may want to write this down as we continue to gain strength for our journey. We gain strength from our harmony. When there is peace in our homes, there is joy in our lives. We can only truly enjoy the harmony in our home when we are in the role that God has designed for us. When I say roles, people start to get a little, uh, what's the word, tetchy? A little jumpy? He's saying women can't be preachers. No, that's not the topic today, okay? And I'm not a complementarian for the record, but we can discuss that another time. I am speaking strictly concerning the roles of the husband and the wife within their home, not in ministry. Maybe that's a sermon for later this year. I don't know. But men are not meant to be alone. Okay, Genesis 2.18 makes this very clear. And even if you are called to singleness, there, that's fine. Singleness does not mean you're dead or unusable to the body of Christ. But this message is more focused for the married couple. So if you are, if you are someone who feels you're called to singleness, that's okay. Uh, don't feel neglected. Don't feel forgotten if you're unmarried. There are still principles within this sermon for you. But... This whole idea of harmony begins within our homes, and it begins with the conduct of our wives and the caring of our husbands. And those are the two main points for your notes, if you'd like to write them down as well. But the first thing we're going to discuss is the conduct of our wives. Now, we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word, by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. And of course, like I said, Peter is speaking to the believer wife, to the Christian wife, the wife that has heard the gospel and has made the decision to follow, to chase Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. The conduct of such a woman is that of submissiveness. And we discussed that at length in our sermon last week. But you can see in this, in this passage today, it begins with that word, 
likewise. In the Greek, it's homoios. And it means in the same way. And it's one of those words that when it begins a chapter, just like the word therefore, or but, or and, it forces you to go back and look behind and see what you've already seen or see what you've already read and how this connects with the previous passage. Now, we've kind of covered this last week, the idea of submissiveness, but it goes back to chapter 2, verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and to the gentle, but also to the unjust. Now, some scholars will speculate that Peter's referring to the example of Christ, which he mentions in verses 21 and 25, or just meaning, in general, be submissive. But that's not what's happening here. Peter's use of homoios, actually, it modifies that to be submissive, and the original reader would, would understand that it goes back to referring to the submissiveness of the servants that was mentioned in verse 18. So in other words, wives, be submissive as a servant is submissive to a master. Now that is not an easy directive, right? Especially in the 21st century. But it is a biblical directive nonetheless. And it's to be done in such a way that the conduct, or anostrophon is the Greek word, her, her way of life will then be, a, a, in essence, an evangelism within her home that will win her husband who is not saved, who is not a follower of Christ. It's something that will win him over and, and make him a follower or make him want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And there are six things that, that I believe that submission is not. This lowliness of wives, there are things they are not. But we're going to contrast a wife who is submissive to an ungodly husband and a wife who is submissive to a godly husband as we go through all six of these things. And again, I want to be clear. The directive Peter has is for a Christian wife married to an ungodly husband. But when Paul writes Ephesians 5, he's talking to a married couple who are both in Christ. Okay, so there's going to be some contrast as we go through this, this point this morning. First and foremost, it does not mean that you agree with everything your husband says. She's a Christian. He is not. Okay, submission means that we submit until it begins to compromise the law of Christ. If we remember last week's sermon, right? Or, or Christ's will for our lives. 1 Peter 3.12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, how many of you know James Dobson? You've heard that name, surely, right? Many people. You don't have to raise your hand. That's okay. But James Dobson wrote this really interesting book. It's called Love Must Be Tough. And if you've ever been in a, in a struggle in your marriage, chances are someone's recommended it to you or you've picked it up. If you know a couple who is divorced, this is, a, this is a book that usually Christians will recommend. In that book, Dr. Dobson talks about a married couple who the wife, in submission, allows another woman to come into their marriage bed. That is not biblical submission. That is not what Peter is telling us to do. In fact, at that point, you're confirming and you're condoning sin, and that is not what biblical submissive look, submissiveness looks like. In fact, she felt so guilty, and, and it, still, their marriage still fell apart. That is not what we're talking about, okay? That's not, you don't have to agree or go along with everything an unchristian husband says. You just need to have that submissive attitude. However, if the, if the husband is in Christ, you may not agree with him. A biblical Christian wife would still let him know that, yet support him because he's still your husband. Ephesians 5.24 says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. But only, and I cannot state this enough, only if he is a Christ-centered husband, not leading the wife into sin. That's who Paul's writing to. That's what he's emphasizing here in Ephesians. Submission also does not mean forgetting your own identity in Christ. Peter said, even if some do not obey the word. And that indicates that some of these men heard the word. These married men heard the word. Their wives submitted to that. But now the, the husband is not a believer. An ungodly spouse's unrighteousness 
is not an excuse for a wife or even a husband to forsake righteousness. 1 Peter 4.19 says, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. For the Christian wife and for the Christian husband, you do not forget who you are in Christ, but your identity, if you have a Christian spouse, your identity is confirmed by them. Your, your identity is encouraged by them in Christ. Ephesians 5.28 says, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. If you're a Christian husband, you're encouraging your wife. You're loving your wife. You're telling her, I know who you are in Christ. And you're affirming, you're confirming what the Bible says about her. Third, submission does not mean you stop trying to change his mind does not mean you give up on an unbelieving spouse. He said that they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, but that does not mean you don't get to use words. Your conduct should speak louder. And we have to be cautious here. There's a word I do not like. I absolutely detest this word. Jennifer will tell you I have used it maybe twice in the 16 years of our marriage and both times it was completely as a joke, and I immediately apologized. I, feel, I felt so bad using that word. Wives must be cautious when they do try to convert their husbands, when they do try to speak to their husbands, lest they become a nag. Every husband in here, I know it, you're saying amen. Okay, say it very quiet. Nagging may win a battle in a marriage. The wife may get her way, and husbands can be nags too. But you will lose your spouse in the moment. We see this actually play out two different times in the life of Samson. The first time is with his Philippian bride. He goes, he tells this riddle to the Philistine soldiers. I said Philippian, I meant Philistine. She's a Philistine bride. He tells this riddle at their wedding party, and the Philistines can't figure it out. So they go to the wife, and they say, you find out the answer. And so the Bible says in, in Judges 14 that she wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard. That word is a Hebrew word, tsuk, T-S-O-O-K, -O -O tsuk. In many translations, it gets translated as she nagged him. We see Delilah do the same thing in Judges 16. When she pressed him hard, when she took with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. Both women got what they wanted after nagging at Samson. One of them, it leads to her own destruction, and the other one, it leads to Samson's destruction. If you want to lose your husband, make your home an inhospitable place. No man wants to feel like he has been at work all day fighting battle after battle just to come home and fight one more with a nagging wife. Husbands, you can say amen very loudly there. It's okay. He won't hit you here. You can't promise what happens in the car. I hate that word. I do. I hate the word nag. I hate what it insinuates about a woman, about a marriage, but I promise you this. God hates what it does to a marriage far more. I imagine Peter, also a married man, lest we forget, also hated it. That's why he emphasized actions over words. But that's not, again, that's not to say you remain silent. Pray for discernment. Pray for opportunities to have those conversations. If he is a believer, his mind does not need to be changed. He has been given the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us. Fourth, submission does not mean following a husband's path over Christ's path. This kind of ties into what we said last week. This is also assuming that the husband is not on Christ's path already. In verse 6, it says, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. You notice in the translation, it's a lowercase l, Lord. Why? because she's not meant to treat him as the Lord. He is an unbeliever. 
In other words, call him sir. Be respectful. That's what that's literally what the Greek is saying there. And again, this is contrasted from Ephesians 5. And some people will read that or hear what I'm going to say, and they'll say, well, but that was Abraham. But Abraham is not Jesus. They're definitely two different people. And Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. But that is in a godly marriage. That's not to say Peter and Paul are in disagreement or that they're even talking past one another. They're actually harmonizing. One is talking about an uh, an unbelieving husband. The other is talking about a believer who is trying to emulate Christ within his own home. And husbands, we'll get to that. That is what we do. Submission also does not mean you gain spiritual guidance from an unbelieving husband. I want to be very clear about this. Believers should not be going to unbelievers for spiritual guidance. Don't go to Oprah to find out how to be a better Christian. I don't care if they claim to be spiritual, even if they claim to be some sort of Christian. If they don't act like it, go to someone who you know is godly. Go to a a sister in Christ, someone at the church, someone you respect, and get advice for them. That's just common sense, right? You would not go to a mechanic and ask him for tips on how to perform neurosurgery. That does not mean the mechanic's an ignorant man or or, or not smart. It's just not his craft. It's not his territory to speak, right? But you go, there are so many times people within the church will go to unbelievers and they'll say, well, I read this book or I saw this thing on TV and it made me feel so spiritual. It made me feel so right with Jesus. Big whoop, who cares? That's from an unbeliever. We don't get that. It's, It's It's trash. Throw it out. The unbeliever does not know the way of a believer. And if you're a believing wife, you don't go to your husband who's an unbeliever and expect him to give you godly, Christian, Christ-centered advice. One reason Paul actually says from the word go, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. In 2 Corinthians 6, he talks at length about this. Our text says they're already married. If you're not married and you're a Christian, Don't date unbelievers. You're yoking yourself, you're tying yourself to someone who's not going to help you, to encourage you, or lift you up, or be a a Christian in their home. But Paul says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord does Christ have with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? And just because Peter goes on, and he, and we're going to talk about this with the, in the men's section, because he calls women a weaker vessel, that does not mean women are without strength. A woman who has faith in Jesus Christ is a mighty woman. She is someone who may still need counsel, so she should go to other mighty women in Christ. Amen? Now, if the husband is a believer... Paul tells us if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. So husbands, a little sidebar here before we really go into that section. It is your job as a man to disciple and be a priest within your home, to be the pastor of your home. If your kids or if your wife come to you with a question about Jesus or about Sunday school or or church-related things, You, as the man of God in that home, it's your duty to seek an answer for them. If you don't know, it is perfectly okay to say, I don't know, I'm going to call Pastor Jeff. Now, if you call me at 4 a.m. with such a question, I'm not going to answer. But if you do call or you send me an email, hey, we were talking at lunch and I didn't have the answer. I'm happy. You can ask Dale. He sends me emails every now and then, or at least he used to. I would send paragraphs back. This is the answer. And hopefully he would have something to take home. It's okay to say, I don't know, or I don't have the answer. But you, as the disciple maker in that home, need to step up and do that very thing. That is part of the godly role of a godly father and husband. And finally, submission does not mean that a godly woman must live in fear. Again, we look at that verse 6. It says, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening, you are Sarah's children. Do not fear anything that is frightening. 
as a woman, you do not, you must not, you should not live in terror, in fear in your own home. Godly man or not, he is there. He is someone who's been entrusted by God to protect you in his role. For the godly man, this should come a second nature within the home as the Holy Spirit operates within him. For the ungodly man, he may need to learn this. He may need to go to counseling. Maybe somebody needs to teach him a lesson. I don't know. Maybe there's something more drastic that has to happen there. But if you're a woman and you're living in fear in your own home, being in submission does not mean living in absolute fear of the man you live with. Paul, for his part on the topic, he's going to talk about wives submitting to their spouse. He's going to do this in Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, 1 Corinthians 11, Titus 2, to say the least. But he says, for the Christian wife, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. That does not mean you submit out of fear of your husband. We see this play out in God's design for the family as the wife submits to the man of the house. In the same way, the church is there to nourish the believer, to encourage, to build up, to help the believer grow. The mother provides nourishment to the babies, right? She's the one who's probably going to spend the most time with the children as they grow within the home as they're being raised. That's one reason I'm very proud of our women's ministry, by the way, because we're getting into, they're getting into good theology. If the enemy is going to take your home, he, tr- he might try and take the husband, but if he takes the wife, if he gives her weak theology, if he gives her just that pudding cup sermons and things like that, pudding cup devotionals, what I call, there's no nutritional value there, he will eventually take the whole home. If he can weaken your wife, men, that's why we protect our wives. That's why we guide and we try to minister to our wives. That's part of our role. So the enemy can't take them and, and uh, ensnare them either. People don't like necessarily that I, I say that uh, children are going to be with their moms the most, but that's, that's the case. That's the way God designed it. That's the role of raising a child and the way a mother does. Now, People might say, well, a husband has just as much of a part in raising a child, and that's true if we understand it's an equal but a different role in the raising of that child. A man is not designed to be a mom. A a mother is not designed to be a father. That's pretty simple. That's Scripture. For the godly wife, the godly mother, who is married to a godly man, this submission comes much easier. There should be harmony within their home if both are fulfilling the roles God has designed for them, both for the woman and for the man. And guys, I put it off as long as I could, but we need to talk about you too. How should men care for their wives? Well, Peter says, likewise, there's that word again, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, there's a reason I put this whole sermon together as a two-point sermon. If I just did talking about the wives, next week the husbands wouldn't want to come back, right? So we need to take this all in scope together. And the bulk so far has been. If you've, if you've looked in your Bible, verses 1 through 6 have dealt with the wife, He only gives you verse 7 for the men. And it's focusing on a wife as she submits to an ungodly husband. And like I said, we contrasted that with Paul. But what makes a man a godly husband? That's a question we have to ask. What does Peter mean when he tells the Christian men he's writing to to live with their wives showing honor? What exactly does that look like? And here's a very scary thought. What does Peter mean when he says our prayers may be hindered? That should should grab our attention as men of God, right? Peter begins with the word likewise. Again, we see that word, it connects us to, to what's just been said, but the tense in the Greek, the tense of the word has actually changed. So does it mean that husbands should submit to their wives? No. It does not mean that. What he's saying here, the tense of the word has changed to mean that 
to continue this discussion further, husbands, if we're commanding submission, then husbands, you better step up and be a man worthy of submitting to. He says to consider the use of their authority over their wives as the weaker vessel. When he tells us to live with our wives in an understanding way, the Greek literally would translate to live in the same house in a way that knows them. In an understanding way is only one Greek word. Four words in English, one in Greek, and it's gnosin. And it means to understand or to know. How many of you men want to throw your hands up and say, I'm out, I can't understand women, right? Because men like to quote Al Bundy. Women understand women and they hate each other, right? That's a man of the world, by the way. That is not the approach of a man who is in Christ. The role of a godly husband is one who seeks to understand his wife. Paul says this, he sheds more light in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And if you're so bold as a man who is a Christian, to quote Ephesians 5.22, Wife, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Well, you better be prepared to be the Lord in your home. You better be prepared to be Jesus in that home. I said this last week. Be prepared to wash your wife's feet, to help her, to love her, to sacrifice for her. That means sacrificing time at work, sacrificing time in front of the TV, sacrificing time of enjoyment for her. Hold on a second, Pastor. I told that woman 50 years ago, I will love you for better or worse. And what I meant was, I'll take a bullet for you, woman. I will slay dragons for you. But that did not mean wash the dishes. That didn't mean clean the bathtub. Pastor Jeff's to-do list right there, right? Not what that meant. That's where you're wrong. That man of God is where we have failed our wives. And when I say we, I mean men in the church. Here's the problem with teaching on things like this within the church, because I've seen this play out. This is where the church has failed men. Guys will come with their wives on Mother's Day, and the sermon is, man, moms are awesome. They're great. Guys, don't you wish you were as cool as mom? And then on Father's Day, the dad's like, all right, she's going to get it. I'm going to church today. And so he goes to church, and what's the sermon? Men, you're awful. You need to step up and be better dads. I've seen that happen. And two months later, the pastor's scratching his head going, how come we can't get men to come to the breakfast on Saturday? Well, the two times they decided to show up, you kicked them and knocked them down. Or, or we've seen the men get tired and burned out at the church. They turn it over entirely to the women. This actually started in the Industrial Revolution when Men would leave their small towns. They'd go to big cities and work in factories. And women would take over all the roles of the home. They'd take over all the roles in the church. And the men would come home and they'd wonder, gee, why is my wife so tired all the time? Why why do I feel like a shadow on the wall? Why do I feel like I'm just a paycheck? Does this sound familiar to anyone? Don't nod your head. Right? So now we have a generation of men who are raised predominantly, almost exclusively by women. And we wonder why guys in their 30s are happy living in grandma's basement, getting their jollies on the internet, and barely holding down a single job. They don't want to be married. They don't want to be husbands. They don't want to be men. I heard a pastor recently say he fully expects to start seeing grown men in strollers pushed by their wives, wearing diapers and sucking on a pacifier because they don't want to be grown-ups anymore. These boy men don't know how to be men. And women still want husbands, so what do they do? They they will latch on to a man and try to raise him. Right? You see where the dynamic is so wrong, so warped? Why we need good teaching on this thing? 
We need men who are willing to live as Christ and love as Christ loved the church. Godly men who understand what sacrificial love looks like and what it means in the home. Paul says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Pastor Nick Pickowitz said this recently, Christianity needs more. Christianity needs more dangerous men. Not immature, unstable, pugnacious, or unloving men. Rather, godly men who cannot be bought or tamed, men whose only allegiance is to Christ and the truth, the prophets and the apostles were such men, and we should pray the Lord sends more. Amen. Paul goes on, he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There is a problem in American marriages where the, dad, or the, the husband doesn't want to leave mom and dad's apron strings behind. They want all the benefits of a marriage while still living like a son. I'm not saying this to be harsh on the men of our church or men in general. I'm saying we need men in the church to be men in the church. And if you're a man in the church and you see a guy living like this, grab that young man by the scruff of the neck and you say, I'm going to show you what it means to be a man. I'm going to show you what it means to be a man of God and love your wife and cherish your wife. Men who know what showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel looks like. I don't mean that you're going to teach them how to scratch and spit or anything like that, like the world defines manhood. Teach them how to wash the dishes, how to change a flat tire, how to raise children, how to be a disciple maker in the home. Guys, we have to do this as heirs with us. Our wives deserve that. By the way, the word to show honor, that's also one Greek word. It's the Greek word to mean. And it means to show value or to make someone feel special. That's literally what it means. Husbands, I'm going to ask you this as, one of, as a husband myself. When's the last time you did something that made your wife feel special? When, not, not when's the last time you tried not when's the last time you brought flowers, threw them on the kitchen table, and said, there you go, happy anniversary. When's the last time you made your wife feel like she was the only woman on earth for you? When is the last time you made her feel cherished and loved? If you don't know, or you can't answer that question, she'll answer it for you. Ladies, amen? You guys are really quiet today. I really thought there'd be a lot more ladies saying amen in this section and men saying amen in the last, but. There are men who will do whatever it takes to make sure his employees or his coworkers love him and think he's the greatest guy on earth. Meanwhile, his wife sits at home feeling abused, manipulated, and neglected. And then we wonder why divorce has happened. As a follower of Christ, we cannot afford to be those men. So many times as Christian men, we want our wives to be Proverbs 31 women, but we don't want to be Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 men. Stop reading books on how to fix your marriage when the book has been written. Going on two centuries. I know it's not as attractive as the book with the, the nice picture of the megachurch pastor on the back, but trust me on this. If you are in Christ and the fruit of Spirit is growing in your life, this is the book to read for your marriage. The fruit of the Spirit, by the way, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That fruit has to exist within your home. Pastor, now you're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. I thought you were preaching on marriage today. Oh, I still am. I still am. Because if you want harmony in your home, you will have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control within your home. You will show that to your wife. And let me tell you something. You want to see life get better? Try that on for size for a few weeks. See how your wife begins to change. See how your home begins to change. Watch harmony begin to fill your house. And home begins to be a more enjoyable place to be. See, the scary thing is we've neglected it for so long and we can't understand why God doesn't listen. As men of God, we can't understand why God wouldn't listen or hear all our prayers 
and answer all our prayers. We don't know why God feels distant at times, and it's because your prayers have been hindered. That's what Peter says. Oh, but God always hears me. Oh, absolutely he does. But you're going to come under discipline for, what you, for how you treat what he's given you. That's what the hindering is. You read in Hebrews 12, verse 6, it says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. God is so concerned with how Christian husbands treat their wives. He wants them to live in an understanding, loving way with their wives that he will discipline them when they're not doing so. Wayne Grudem says it like this, No Christian husband should presume to think that any spiritual good will be accomplished by his life without an effective ministry of prayer. And no husband may expect an effective prayer life unless he lives with his wife in an understanding way, bestowing honor on her. As men who follow Christ, hear me on this, as men who follow Christ, we have to take, ta- take time to develop and maintain a marriage that reflects Christ. Not just for our children's sake. Not just for those within our home, but for the world around us. I'm going to move to close in just a moment. But a good marriage, like I said, is one that serves Jesus, reflects Jesus, and glorifies Jesus. If you're a spouse and you're married to someone who's an unbeliever, then take courage. Be strengthened, press on, and know God knows your struggle and you do not go through that alone. You don't fight that battle alone. If you're an unbelieving spouse, then today is the day to accept the truth. Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sin. All your failings, all your rebellions, everything that has separated you from God the Father your whole life, Jesus died so they could be wiped away. In fact, he took those sins upon himself upon the cross, in order for you to be made right before a holy, righteous God. If you believe that, if you make that decision to follow Him, He will come into your life, and He will begin to change things. He will begin to change you, to purify you, to cleanse you, and make you a new creation in Him. But you're also going to be a new creation within your home. If you're a wife, and you've not been living as a godly wife, maybe you've been a nag. Again, I don't like that word. This is the last sermon you'll probably ever hear me use that word. But maybe you've been a nag. Maybe you have not been grateful. Maybe you've not been respectful to your husband. Then I would challenge you, grab that man by the hand, and you go somewhere in the sanctuary. Come to the front, pray at the altar, stay where you are. You grab him this morning, and you pray together. And if you're the husband, and you've not been living in the way you should be living at home, You've not made that woman feel loved. You've not made that woman feel special. You've not treated her with the tenderness that she needs. Then you grab her hand, you ask for forgiveness, and you pray together. For some of you, this may be the first time you've prayed together in months, weeks, years. Maybe you need to leave somewhere. Maybe you've got kids, you need to go somewhere and get away for a little bit. Maybe you need to dump the kids off at mom and dad's for a few hours so you can go and have these conversations and you can pray together. So be it. But do what you must do to be the godly man and the godly woman that you are called to be within your home. And you make a promise to one another, a sincere promise to start over, to start fresh. Love keeps no record of wrongs, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Move forward. Move past the things in the past. Both of you on a path towards Christ together. You know, a good marriage is like a triangle. With the husband and the wife at the bottom and Christ at the top. And the closer you get to Christ, the closer you get together. The closer you grow together. That's a Christian marriage. That's what it should look like. Before I close in prayer, I want to leave you with this last verse, Ephesians 4.32. If nothing else today, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. Heavenly Father, this morning, I pray for the marriages of our church. I pray for marriage in general, Lord, the sacred thing you created. Lord, you are the designer of marriage. You're the designer of the, of the husband and the wife. And you've created it for your glory. 
And Lord, I pray for harmony in homes. I pray that we step into the role that you've called us to be, that we've accepted when we said the, our marriage vows, Lord. And Father God, I pray today that our marriages be a source of evangelism for you, that our marriages be used for building your kingdom, that people will see how we treat our wives, how we treat our husbands, and Lord, they will say that is a marriage that has Christ within it. Father, I pray you're glorified above all this morning. I pray that our prayers are not hindered, but that you teach us to love our wives as they should be loved. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.